Harit, let's see. Hi, how do we? Okay. I think we're finally set up. It's good. Thanks. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice break. It was a good time, hopefully. Finally, the weather is getting better, but it's not clear, frankly. Uh, hopefully, you'll remember uh, what we covered last time. Uh, and please fill out the feedback forms. Uh, today, we may actually have, if you have time at the end, we'll have some feedback session also, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> Uh, but please, I would like everyone to fill out the forms so that I can get a good picture of everyone's thinking. Okay, so just to remind you, it's been a while, actually. It's been two weeks since we studied uh, computer architecture. Uh, and last time we covered uh, precise exceptions. Today, we're going to jump into a topic that's, I mean, I think all of the topics here in this course are fascinating. But in my opinion, this is actually quite fascinating because... Here, we're going to build an out of order execution machine that takes a sequential instruction stream and basically turns it into a data flow graph internally and executes it out of order. And by just looking at the state of the machine, you can reconstruct the data flow graph of the instructions that are executing in the machine. So how cool is that basically? Instead of having a sequential instruction stream, you're really going to break it down into out of order instructions. Okay, so basically this builds on a lot of the concepts that we discussed. We've been covering microarchitecture, how to get how to achieve high performance basically. And if you uh, remember, uh, last week we covered pipelining and precise exceptions, actually a little bit over last week, meaning before the break and one week before the break. And you remember precise exceptions reordable for hopefully. And before that we covered microarchitecture, single cycle, multi-cycle. So we're, we're basically pushing for higher and higher performance and this higher and higher performance is coming at the expense of higher, higher and higher complexity. So today we're going to add even more complexity to get even higher performance. And by the end of this lecture, you'll get the state of the art. Or, I mean, at least the principles of the state of the art of existing uh, CPUs, general purpose CPUs. So if you look at, for example, uh, Intel CPUs, AMD CPUs, NVIDIA CPUs, I'm not talking about GPUs, uh, Apple CPUs, they're all operating based on the principles that we're going to discuss today, essentially. They do a lot of optimizations on top of what we're going to discuss. Unfortunately, in this basic course, we don't have time to go into those optimizations. But if you ever get a chance to actually design an out of order execution engine, uh, jump on it because you will learn a lot. And it's a fascinating uh, piece of execution engine in the end. It's quite complicated, uh, but the principles are actually simple, as you will see. Okay, so today basically we're going to handle, we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to talk about out of order execution. Probably we won't have time for load store handling, which is the most complicated part of out of order execution, actually. And uh, we will probably release a video if you're interested in knowing about load store handling. You can watch it. But uh, I never ask questions about load store handling in the exam, it's just an extra. But keep in mind that that's the most complicated part of an out of order execution engine. And it will become more clear maybe if we get a chance to discuss it. Okay, so that's the roadmap uh, that we have. And uh, these are the readings. Uh, how many people have done this reading out of curiosity? The microarchitecture or superscalar processors? No one? Okay, not yet, at least. If you actually do the reading, you will see that it puts together a lot of the things that we have discussed in this course. Maybe not exactly in the same way that I described them, uh, but uh, you will 
you will certainly reinforce a lot of the concepts. And again, if you think that you're not understanding something really well, the readings are actually very helpful. You need to, uh, you need to uh, dynamically decide whether or not you really want to do the readings, basically. And there are some optional readings, like uh, this is a beautiful reading that talks about the Alpha 21 plus for microprocessor, which is an out of order execution engine. And tomorrow and next week, we're going to start covering a branch prediction. Uh, and that's going to be an important component of out of order execution as well, as we will see tomorrow. We kind of covered branch prediction, if you remember, when we talked about pipelining, what happens when you get to a control flow instruction, we said. But we're going to cover uh, more of that tomorrow and next week, essentially. But today, let's jump into out of order execution. But before jumping into that, this is what we covered last time, right? We built an in order pipeline, we had multi cycle execution meaning instructions, different instructions can go through different parts of the pipeline with different latencies. Here you see addition, multiplication, floating point multiplication, load store. That's just an example, right? And we said that uh, uh, we basically, uh, this, this pipeline essentially is here, it's in order over here. Uh, when, you, when you're dispatching instructions to the execution, it's, it's in order. So we're not changing the in order execution principles, but the instructions are completing out of order, okay? But, and, and we retire instructions in order. So we're gonna be more aggressive today. So we're gonna look at what's the problem with this pipeline uh, today. So if, just to, again, uh, you've seen this last time, just to jog your memory, in the decode stage, uh, basically we have a reorder buffer, right? Reorder buffer reorders the instructions and makes sure that oldest instruction in the machine writes to the register file first. That's the idea of the reorder buffer. And to be able to do that in the decode stage, when an instruction is being decoded, and this happens sequentially in sequential program order, uh, the instruction accesses the register file and reorder buffer. It allocates an entry in the reorder buffer, checks if the instruction can execute based on the valid bits in the register file, if you remember. If so, you dispatch the instruction. Otherwise, uh, dispatch meaning send the instruction to the function list. Otherwise, one, is, one source probably is not valid. Well, not probably, at least one source is not valid. Then you need to wait for that source to be produced. And that source, uh, uh, that source can be uh, in the register file or the reorder buffer or in the bypass pass, as we discussed last time, if you remember, right? So this is all last week's, well, not last week's, but two weeks ago's uh, lecture uh, where we discussed uh, how to uh, design a pipeline with a reorder buffer. So we're going to go through this, uh, at least part of the pipeline again today. So that's the decode stage. Uh, in the execute stage, instructions can complete out of order. And in, uh, when they complete, they write the result to the reorder buffer. And there's a separate retirement or commit stage where you check for exceptions. If the instruction, you basically check for exceptions in the oldest instruction. If the oldest instruction doesn't have any exceptions, it writes its result from, uh, to the architecture register file or memory. And if there's an exception, you flush the pipeline and start from an exception handle. So we discussed this also in the last lecture, exception handling and precise exceptions. Uh, okay, is this clear? So you remember, hopefully, if you don't remember, again, the reading is a great place to, the, to uh, jog your memory. But of course, you have the videos uh, and you can watch them also. And we actually spent a lot of time to build the reorder buffer. And I gave you examples uh, with drawings uh, uh, and we will do some of those uh, today as well. OK, so let's take a look at the data dependence types. One of the things that I said with the reorder buffer is reorder buffer eliminates anti and output dependencies, right? Because you're really renaming uh, instructions to the reorder buffer entries. Uh, whereas flow dependencies remain. So uh, basically, and uh, this is just, again, we also discussed this uh, last time, output and anti-dependence are not true dependencies. So if you go back over here, this anti-dependence, uh, these are one actually have nothing to do with each other except they share the name, right? There is no producer-consumer relationship between the two instructions here. There is no producer-consumer relationship between the two instructions over here. They just happen to write to the same register. Here, one of them happens to write to the same register that the other is reading from. But there is no relationship. There is no semantic relationship between the two instructions. Here, there's a clear semantic data flow relationship. The data produced by this instruction should be consumed by this instruction over here. That's why this is a true dependence or flow dependence or data flow dependence. Whereas these are not real dependencies. They just exist because you don't have enough architectural registers to specify names, basically. So we discussed this again uh, uh, in, uh, in, at length in the last lecture. So basically these anti and output dependencies are not true dependencies. The same register values, uh, refer, uh, the same register refers to values that have nothing to do with each other, as I just said. And they exist due to lack of register IDs or names in the ISA. So what the reorder buffer did for us is it's 
uh, rename the register to the reorderable for entry that will hold the register value. If you remember, we have a register alias table. Uh, actually, uh, I, don't, I don't have it over here, but yeah, maybe I don't want to switch to it right now. But uh, we have a register alias table and that register, uh, sorry, we have a register file and that register file is a valid bit for each register. If the register is valid, then the value is trusted. Then you get the value from the register file. If the register is not valid, you have a tag. And that tag is the pointer to the reorder buffer entry of the instruction that is going to produce that value. So now we rename the architectural register to the reorder buffer entry that's going to produce that architectural register. That's called renaming. So that's going to be very fundamental to our execution as we will see. So basically we rename the register ID to the reorder buffer ent entry ID. But again, as we will later see in this lecture, it doesn't have to be the reorder buffer entry. It can be any name as long as it's unique and as long as it enables linking of the producer's result to the consumer, then that name is perfect. Right? Basically, you, it can be any namespace that you can use. It doesn't have to be the reorder buffer entry. So I think I like thinking of this as you're renaming an architectural register ID to a physical register ID. And that physical register ID is the ID that's used to communicate the value between the instructions, between a producer and a consumer. And again, we're going to go through another example of this uh, soon. So after this renaming, the order by for entry ID is used to refer to the register, as we have discussed, right? If an, an, uh, an instruction is writing to register three, and uh, that register three becomes invalid, and the instruction is still in the pipeline, the instruction that register three will come from the reorder buffer entry that register uh, that uh, this uh, this instruction is allocated to. It could be reorder buffer entry 125, for example. So that's the name for register three for all the all the instructions that would source register three. Okay, so basically doing so eliminates anti and output dependencies so that you don't stall the pipeline. If you remember in the pipeline, we did not stall the pipeline for anti and output dependencies. This renaming enables you to continue. Uh, uh, to fetch instructions into the pipeline, decode them until you get to true data flow dependence space. Okay, basically the reason this happens is you give the illusion that there are a large number of registers. Even though there are not a large number of architectural registers, microarchitecturally you have this reorder buffer that enables you to rename, rename the registers to this larger namespace that's internal, that's not visible to the program. Okay, I spent some time on this one uh, because this is really crucial for building out of order execution. Out of order execution is all about linking producer instructions to consumer instructions, such that when the producer instruction produces the value, the consumer instructions get notified and capture that value internally using hardware structures, of course, right? So this register renaming enables us to communicate between producers and consumers. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll see that in a little bit. So, uh, that's, where, uh, that's why uh, reorder buffer it comes before uh, uh, what we discussed uh, before out of order execution. So out of order execution is also called dynamic instruction scheduling. Uh, if you think about compile time instruction scheduling, it's static, right? It's before the uh, program is executing. Of course, you can have a binary compiler that does dynamic scheduling, but it's not like the hardware. Hardware is doing the scheduling uh, every, every cycle in this particular case. Okay. So uh, the, uh, essentially, this is our in-order pipeline uh, that we uh, discussed. So let me clarify the name dispatch. Dispatch is really the act of sending an instruction to a functional unit. So renaming the order buffer eliminates stalls due to false dependencies. So whenever you get a false dependence over here, no problem. Uh, because the instruction is not really depending on the value, it's just depending on a name, you rename the register and you can dispatch the instruction to its functional unit. So it can keep going. Unfortunately, uh, a true data dependence stalls dispatch of younger instruction into functional units. Meaning, if you have an instruction over here that's being decoded, and it's, it needs a value that's to be produced in the pipeline, and that value is not produced yet. It's not in the register file. The register file says reorder buffer entry 55 is going to produce it. So you go and check reorder buffer entry 55. Reorder buffer entry 55 says, I haven't produced this value yet. It's invalid. So what do you do? You stall the pipeline. And you're not going to get it from the bypass pass. I'm kind of ignoring bypass pass right now, but uh, basically you stall at that point in time because you don't have a place to put this instruction. At. So this is important to realize. What we built so far uh, is good at eliminating uh, false dependencies, but it cannot do anything about true dependencies. True dependencies still stall the pipeline. If, you have a, if the instruction that you're decoding uh, is sourcing a register 
whose value is not available yet, either in the register file reorderable for bypass paths, because an instruction is going to produce it and it has not produced it yet, then you need to wait. And this is the stall basically that we're talking about. Okay, so remember last time I used the same picture uh, to uh, show exceptions. Exceptions on true data defense are actually have actually some similarities. But basically you can think of this uh, particular tram as a long latency instruction that hasn't produced the value yet, uh, that is going to be consumed by some uh, other instruction maybe, I don't know, analogy breaks down over there. But what I care about this is an independent instruction, meaning this independent tram that is supposed to go through some pipeline, but it cannot go through because this instruction stole the pipeline, right? And in fact, you will see that this independent instruction, independent tram has nothing to do with this instruction. It's not going to go through this way. It's actually going through, going through this way, meaning it's going to go through a completely different place and it's completely independent. It doesn't need to wait. And I think this is a very good analogy. This tram uh, has to wait, unfortunately, because you don't have enough resources. You didn't have enough lines, enough lanes in your tram uh, system uh, so that this tram could go, even though it was completely independent, right? That's the idea, basically. The idea of out-of-order execution is someone stores a pipeline for whatever reason, independent instructions should go and execute. Okay, and then you can also extend the analogy to these independent instructions potentially. Okay, and remember the uh, picture last time. So I use this to motivate exceptions, but I think it works nicely for independent instructions also. So at some point, of course, uh, the, the, the stalling instruction stops and independent instructions finally goes to its execution unit and it gets scheduled. Okay, but we don't want to wait for, we don't want an independent instruction that has nothing to do with the stalling instruction to wait, essentially, that's the idea. But our hands are tied with the pipeline we designed earlier. A true data depends stalls the dispatch of any instruction, any younger instruction into the pipeline because we're fetching instructions sequentially, we're decoding them sequentially, we're putting them into the reorder buffer sequentially, uh, and we cannot put any younger instruction regardless of whether or not it's independent or dependent on a value that's going to be produced in the pipeline. So we're going to fix that in this lecture, basically. Any questions? Hopefully this is all clear. A lot of this was review, but hopefully it's important review. So basically we're gonna ask the question, can we do better? Do we really have to stall the pipeline for uh, uh, instructions in sequential order, even though they're independent? And the answer is basically yes. But before we go into it, uh, let's take a look at why this happened. So these are two code examples on the left and on the right. They're exactly the same, except that the first instructions are different. One is a multiply and the other is a loop. So I kind of answered the first one. Uh, uh, but there's another answer over here. Basically, uh, these two pieces of code uh, have in common that the, the first ad stalls the whole pipeline, right? So why, uh, basically, uh, you have a multiply instruction. Multiply takes long. That's the assumption. I didn't say it over here, but multiplies usually take long. Uh, this ad comes. It gets decoded, but it cannot continue because the multiply didn't produce R3 yet. So this ad stalls. It cannot be decoded. It cannot go into the execution yet. And because the ad cannot go into the execution yet, these blue instructions over here, they're blue because they're independent of either the multiply or the at, as you can see. As a result, they cannot go into the pipeline also. Make sense? So basically these two pieces of code have in common that they're both stalled whenever you decode the at. Okay. Ad cannot, in other words, ad cannot dispatch because it's source registers. Well, it should be source register. One of the source registers is unavailable, right? Uh, maybe I should fix it. So dynamic error correction is a good idea. Okay, yeah, because R1 is uh, available. Okay, and as a result, the important thing is later independent instructions cannot go into the pipeline and cannot get executed. But you can see that there, these are blue, meaning that they have nothing to do with the values that are going to be produced by multiply NAT. Okay, there's also a difference between the two code portions. Can anybody tell me what the difference between the two code portions is? That basically goes into the difference between multiply and load and their latencies. Any thoughts? Which code would you want to have? The one, on, the one with the multiplier or load? Yes? Yes, why? Exactly, so yeah, basically load, uh, I would put it in a different way. Load, is, load could be much slower because it could be variable latency. Right? It could be thousands of cycles, right? But yes, exactly, that's the reason. Multiply is short latency. Load is longer latency, and load is usually variable latency across many latencies because it could be 
in the first level, we'll, we'll cover caching it toward the end of this lecture, uh, toward the end of this class, but uh, it could be hidden the cache. It could be hidden the second level cache, third level cache, fourth level cache, fifth level cache memory. And the latency difference between those is on the order of a few cycles, 40 cycles, 100 cycles, and maybe thousands of cycles, right? So basically the difference is that it's very hard to schedule the instructions. Uh, uh, well, well, load latency is variable, unknown until runtime, whereas multiply latency is usually not variable. Although remember last time we discussed, I said that multiply can be multiplying with zero. And when you have a multiplication with zero, the hardware may have a special logic that checks whether one of the sources is zero. And if one of the sources is zero, then you can actually uh, make the multiply much faster uh, than if one of the sources is not zero. So multiply latency can also be variable, but load latency is variable across a very wide range of values. As a result, it becomes very difficult to schedule these instructions uh, by the compiler. So basically, uh, so what is this effect? This affects compiler essentially. Lo compiler, if you remember, we talked about code scheduling so that you can keep the pipeline full and you don't stall. One way of reducing the stalls is actually scheduling the code so that these independent instructions come earlier, right? So this add doesn't come right after multiply and these independent instructions are scheduled before the add. If you can do that, that's great. Maybe it's easier to do with multiply because the latencies are short. And if the latency is not variable, that's great. But with loads, latencies are actually quite variable and not necessarily short. Sometimes it could be three cycles, sometimes it could be a thousand cycles. Then think about compiler, thinking about, okay, how am I going to schedule this code so that it doesn't stall, so that I can minimize the stalls? It becomes very difficult, basically. Okay, we discussed this uh, also in earlier lectures a bit. Okay, so let's talk about uh, prevent. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, these two pieces of code show that uh, whenever you have a dependency, you cannot move the pipeline. You cannot dispatch, basically. Essentially, you have a dispatch stall. As a result, later independent instructions cannot get executed. So how can you prevent it? Basically, the fundamental problem is you have in-order dispatch. In other words, in-order scheduling, in-order execution, this is called. Uh, I like dispatch because dispatch is very specific sending an instruction to a functional unit from the decode stage, essentially. So the solution is really out of order dispatch. Uh, this is also called out of order scheduling or execution. I mean, there are other solutions that I, I have at the bottom of the slide, but, but actually we kind of seen the solution, the basic idea of the solution before, and this is really data flow. So we're going to build a data flow engine internally. If you remember the data flow, when we discussed data flow versus von Neumann, I said that an instruction only gets fetched and executed when its inputs are ready. So basically, you have an instruction. Uh, you're going to schedule it to the, to the functional unit when you figure out its inputs are ready. Otherwise, the instruction is going to wait somewhere. That's the idea, basically. We're going to create an area where the instructions are going to wait, and we're going to monitor whether the sources of each instruction is going to be valid. Whenever the sources of an instruction becomes valid, that instruction gets scheduled into the execution unit and you keep doing this space. So for this, you need to create an area that I just discussed, right? It's called a waiting area or reservation stations as you will see in a little bit. But the principle that we're gonna exploit is essentially the state of law. Okay. Uh, but the key difference will be that we're not gonna expose this to the ISA. This is all going to happen without the programmer's knowledge. The programmer will still write a sequential code. They will assume the code is sequentially executed because all of the architectural values are updated sequentially, well, Neumann model. But underneath the uh, hardware will break uh, that sequentiality. Okay, so any other way to prevent dispatch stalls? I think I've already given you some of them. Uh, so you don't have to do this. This out of order dispatch is uh, one way of doing it, but you can also do compile time instruction scheduling or reordering as we discussed in the earlier slide. But this becomes very difficult as your latencies become variable. So compiler cannot predict the latencies. We discussed profiling, compiler can profile the code and guess what the latencies could be, but it's not perfect. So compile time scheduling is actually very difficult. And people have actually invested a lot into compile time scheduling of instructions. It's useful, but unfortunately it doesn't match the performance of what we're going to discuss, which is out of order execution in hardware. Because in hardware, you basically know the latencies exactly at that point in time while the latencies are occurring, right? And you do it on a very instruction specific basis, as we will see. So clearly this can help. Value prediction is another idea that we discussed, remember? Whenever you have a dispatch stall because you don't know the value of a register, well, why don't you predict it? So in the previous example, we didn't have the value of R3. Why not just predict it as zero? I, I'm, I'm guessing that it's going to be zero. I'm going to execute the instructions, assuming that it's going to be zero. And then I'm going to verify. And if my verification doesn't 
turn out correct, then I'm going to flush the pipeline and start the execution of the instructions, just like a branch misprediction flush. Right? This is interesting, but this is also not a very viable technique, and it's not employed. Uh, very limited forms are employed in existing process because this is not very accurate today. Actually, it's not. Uh, it's accurate if you know what's going on in the program, and that uh, becomes very difficult to communicate uh, in general. Okay, there's also one more thing actually, which is fine grain multi threading. Again, these are concepts that we've covered. Fine grain multi threading says you don't have two instructions in the pipeline from the same thread uh, at the same time, meaning you don't have any dispatch stalls, assuming that all threads are independent. And that was the assumption we made in fine grain multi threading. Right? So you have many threads. All threads are independent, and you never have two instructions from the same thread in the pipeline. This means that you never stall the pipeline, which is great for handling any kind of dependence, control dependence and data dependence. But it hurts single thread performance, right? So if you care about a single thread, and for example, whenever I'm uh, touching my phone and uh, I want something to react to me, if I'm only interacting with a single thread, which is usually the case, actually, it's very latency sensitive, right? And that thread's performance is really important for me. This doesn't help me, basically. And in, there are many cases in systems where single thread performance is important. So fine grain multi-threading actually completely can eliminate dispatch stalls if you don't care about single thread performance, if all you care about is multi-thread throughput, as we discussed also. So out of order execution is actually different from all of these, essentially. It's very similar to compile time scheduling, except the scheduling is done at runtime in a data flow manner. OK, any questions? Again, I'm covering some concepts uh, that we covered earlier, but now we're going to go into how we actually enable out order execution. And the key idea is, as I said earlier, we want to move the dependent instructions or every instruction out of the, uh, to some area, waiting area, let's say. And the key is this enables moving of the dependent instructions out of the way of independence. The problem was uh, you have a dependent instruction that's stalling the dispatch of independent instructions. Why don't you move the dependent instruction somewhere, let it wait, for its values, and then let the independent instructions go. Uh, basically, we're, we're going to enable independent ones to execute. So hopefully, this is a simple concept, right? I think of this as rest areas. Like if you're driving, how many of you drive cars? OK, <laughs> that's good. How many of you don't drive? I'm curious also. That's probably an interesting question, too. I, I mean, I, I drive, but I don't drive a lot, let's say, <laughs> these days. So basically, when you're driving on the highway, uh, you may have a rest area, right? If you want to go slow or if you want to stop, what do you do? You don't stop on the highway, right? You, you pull to the side and you make sure you wait in the rest area. It's essentially a similar analogy, right? Instructions are going. There are some dependent, independent cars behind you. In the pipeline that we built, it kind of doesn't make sense, right? Uh, we, we basically have dependent, in, uh, independent instructions wait because somebody is taking too long to do something. So. Very similar to the rest areas, we're going to move the uh, where we move the cars or the cars that need to take longer for whatever reason. They need to sleep, uh, they need to use the restroom, whatever. They need to eat. They don't stop in the middle of the pipeline, in the middle of the highway. They go to the rest area and they wait. Okay, the analogy ends here because their waiting is dependent on uh, something else. Okay, but basically, this, these are going to be called reservation stations. We're going to store the instructions into reservation stations and not just the dependent ones. We're going to be very methodical about it. We're going to put every instruction into what is called the reservation stations. And these instructions are going to wait for the values that they need. And while they're waiting in that waiting area or resting area, they will monitor the source values that they need. When all of the source values of an instruction are available, some logic will fire or dispatch the instruction to its execution unit. Uh, and instructions are essentially dispatched in data flow order this way, right? If you think about it, no control flow order. Instructions are fetched and decoded and renamed, as we will see in control flow or sequential order. But dispatching is done out of this waiting buffer, reservation stations in data flow order, depending on the availability of their values. Okay, so the key benefit is really whenever some instruction is taking a long time, you're not stalling. That's the idea. This is also called latency tolerance. You are allowing the independent instructions to execute and complete in the presence of a long latency operation. And it could be any long latency operation. It could be because of a data dependence. It could be because of something else. Uh, long latency operation is the key. And it could be this long latency operation can be thousands of cycles. Keep it in mind. Cycles, four cycles also. 
Okay, let me give you an example, and we're going to go through this uh, uh, with, with the uh, animation also. So this was the pipeline that we built, and this is one piece of code, as you can see over here. I marked the dependent instructions in red. I marked the independent instruction in blue. And if you actually go through this uh, and uh, assume that each execution takes, let's say, uh, yeah, four cycles for multiply, I think one cycle for add, that's the assumption over here. I should write that assumption, we will need it. Uh, but, uh, but basically, uh, what happens is, in order dispatch uh, processor with precise exceptions stalls for dependent instructions, right? So whenever you see dependent instruction, you see a stall. But also independent instruction also stalls. So this blue instruction also stalls. Here, another dependent instruction, it stalls, fine. Uh, and because blue instructions basically get delayed because there is a dependent instruction before them. But if you do out of order dispatch and precise exceptions, what happens is second instruction add here, the, the red add uh, that is adding into R3, instead of stalling, it goes into a waiting area. And it waits in the waiting area. While it's waiting, other instructions can go into the waiting area and can decode it and can get executed. Basically, you can see that the blue instructions are, can continue executing while the dependent instructions, red instructions are waiting. So there is no stall uh, of the pipeline because there are some data dependencies over here. And if you actually calculate the number of cycles, even in this very simple code example, in this, you can say that, oh, this is not interesting code example. And I, I kind of argue, uh, agree with that. But even in this very simple code example, you reduce the execution time from 16 cycles to 12 cycles, which is significant, right? It's 25% it's basic. Okay, so we're gonna go into how to enable it. Let me give you the key ideas to enable this basically. Uh, first of all, uh, you need to link the consumer of a value to the producer so that the dependent instructions can get the value that they need while they're waiting, right? Dependent instructions are going to wait, but the question is where are they going to get the value? Whenever the producer instruction produces a value, they should be notified. And that's what's enabled by renaming, basically. Second, you need to buffer instructions until they're ready to execute. This is the waiting area is for. Instructions need to keep track of the readiness of their source values. I already discussed actually all of these, uh, but I'm going to uh, link them to the hardware structures in a little bit. And fourth is, uh, okay, something is going fast. Basically, when all source values of an instruction are ready, you need to dispatch the instruction to its functional unit. These are the four things that you need to enable out of order execution. Right? So we actually know how to do the linking of the consumer value, uh, consumer of a value to the producer. This is called registry naming. We basically associate a tag or name with each data value. And that name is, uh, is produced by the consumer, uh, produced by the producer uh, and uh, consumed by the consumer. Basically consumers, and producers communicate through these tags, okay? And you need to buffer the instructions until they're ready to execute, insert the instruction to reservation stations after renaming, and we will see that. Uh, how do instructions keep track of readiness of their source values? So whenever an instruction finishes and produces value, it broadcasts this tag to all over the machine, meaning it sends this tag saying that I produced uh, the value for this tag, and anybody who's waiting for this tag meaning anybody who, is who wants to consume the value that I'm going to produce should capture the value that I'm sending. So this is the critical part, basically. Well, all of them are critical together, but uh, the instructions that produce the value broadcast the tag and instructions that are waiting in this waiting buffer, reservation stations, compare their source tags to the broadcast tag. If there's a match, source value becomes ready. They basically capture the value that's being broadcast. So this is how you link, the you link the instruction and this is how you capture the value that's produced by a producer instruction. Does this make sense? Yeah, we're going to go through uh, uh, an example. So it's going to become even more clear. But after this, when all source values of an instruction are ready, instruction wakes up. And if multiple instructions wake up at the same time, you need to select one instruction per functional unit. And we will see that multiple instructions can potentially make up in different functional units as well. So you need to have enough resources to enable this. So by just looking at this, now you can imagine the hardware resources to uh, enable something like this, right? Uh, for example, broadcasting the tag requires a lot of wires all over the place. Comparing the source tags to the, to the broadcast tag requires comparators. And if you want to have a waiting buffer that's as large as, I don't know, 100 instructions, now you have 100 instructions and 100 comparators, actually 200 comparators, right? And this waiting buffer actually can, can be a centralized buffer or per functional unit, as we will see. So the complexity actually increases. Wires and comparators all over the place, basically. 
Okay, and then there's other complexity to enable waking up, etc. So this is all hardware logic that does this. Okay, so this uh, basically what I just described is a version of Thomas Sowell's algorithm. Uh, this out of order in, uh, execution with registry renaming was invented by Robert Th Thomas Sullo at IBM. Uh, and I, uh, especially IBM 3691 floating point units use this. And if you're really interested, I would recommend reading this paper. It's an old paper, so their terminology is a bit different. The major difference today is, so when IBM 3691 was built, there was no precise exceptions for that on that machine. So there was out of order execution, it was high performance, but it was terrible to program. So in terms of history, uh, what, uh, it was actually very difficult to build this machine because they had to go to the highest levels of the IBM, meaning the almost the present level, to get permission to actually build this machine because they were violating the precise exceptions. And they were permitted. They built the machine. Unfortunately, it was a nightmare to debug because you didn't have precise exceptions. As a result, this machine was not really commercially successful. But of course, today we have auto order machines in every process, even though the predecessor is almost 55 years old, right? So what is the major difference today? The major difference is precise exceptions. Basically, we don't just do auto order execution and write the values in out of order. We write the values in order using a reorder buffer. And this was actually provided by these two works that were similar works uh, in 1980s. And Intel Pentium Pro, which is the first really commercially successful out of order processor, which made Intel really a lot of money, let's say, uh, used the ideas that were provided in these two works to do out of order execution with precise exceptions, essentially. And if you're really interested in a paper that talks about the politics and management of this, I'd recommend the book called Pentium Chronicles uh, by Robert Colwell, Bob Colwell, who was uh, the chief architect of Pentium Pro. And he wrote this relatively thin book that talks about uh, uh, essentially the management politics and some technical issues related to uh, how to enable Pentium Pro. Okay, but uh, basically uh, I, this is important because this, this gives you the broader perspective, right? So an idea may be nice and it may actually be implemented early on, but it may not be successful because you violated the contract between the programmer and the hardware, right? Imprecise exceptions. That's why you don't want imprecise exceptions. You want precise exceptions. And it's good to know the history. So, but today, out of order variants are used in most high performance processors. Everything essentially out there that's high performance uses out of order execution with precise exceptions. Okay, so this is what I uh, think of when I think of a modern pipeline. Basically, we have an in order fetch and decode and rename stage. And then we have a waiting buffer that schedules the instructions. This is where dynamic scheduling is done. And then instructions are scheduled based on the data flow order into the execution units. Here, everything is out of order, data flow order. And then they write their values, they broadcast their tags and values. And then when the instruction becomes oldest, it can retire. So there's a reordering step over here. So schedule, reorder. This part of the pipeline is in order so that we can link the instructions correctly. Why is this in order? Why, cannot, why can we not write instructions or dispatch instructions out of order? Because we need to link the producer to the consumer. We need to follow the semantics of the program and if you start fetching instructions out of order, it doesn't make sense. That's the reason why this part is in order. And the same reason, actually, a similar thing applies over here. The, this is to make sure that the sequential uh, execution semantics of the ISA is uh, preserved. Okay, now we're gonna go into how to do this, but if my computer late. So there are two humps, basically. Yeah, you kind of saw the two humps in the Tamil. Uh, so basically we have reservation stations or scheduling window over here that essentially buffers instructions. And then we have a reordering hump that buffers information about instructions, reorder buffer. And we've seen the reorder buffer. Today, we're gonna to see the reservation stations. And uh, just to get the terminology, this is called a scheduler or scheduling window. And reorder buffer is also called an instruction window or active window. So reorder buffer contains all the instructions that are decoded, but not yet retired, not yet finished, uh, complete, uh, not yet retired out of the machine, not yet updated the architectural state, if you remember retire. Scheduler contains all of the instructions that are decoded and not yet finished execution. Although there are some design choices that go into the scheduler also. So I liken this to a two humped camel. Here's a scheduler, here's a reordering buffer. And you can think about fetching and decoding and retiring also at the end. Anyway, analogy breaks at some point, right? <laughs> all of the analogies break. Okay, so this is from your book. 
uh, no, sorry, not book, uh, from the paper that I recommended. And I still recommend it. If you want to really reinforce these concepts, uh, take a look at that pa uh, paper and read it. Uh, we'll have a lot lighter readings, uh, readings to uh, the, the remaining part of the course. It's mainly going to be uh, overview papers like this. And because there are no books that really cover uh, in detail what we cover. If you look at Harris and Harris, it doesn't cover out of word execution that much, for example, even though it's implemented in all processors, right? That's the, uh, it's important to know. Okay, so Thomas Sowell's machine actually was similar. I'm going to show you an example of what kind of looks like a Thomas Sowell's machine, but not exactly uh, uh, to, uh, to motivate you or, or to go through it. But just to show you, so these are floating point units basically. And this is a real machine actually, this is full room. So if you think about a machine in 1960s, that's not this. This room is the machine, basically. And uh, IBM 361 was, was this machine, basically, if you uh, look at it. And this is another example. It's just a console display of it. So we've come a long way, basically. Okay, so uh, before we go into an example, let's talk about register renaming uh, again. So uh, keep this in mind. We're going to eliminate anti and output dependencies uh, with it we are renaming. We're going to approximate the performance effect of a large number of registers, even though ISA is a small number. And remember last time we had this register rename table, right? This was the, uh, this was the register file actually last time. I'm going to call it register rename table. It's going to be essentially the same thing, but I'm going to change a few things to enable out of order execution uh, because I'm going to ignore the reorder buffer for now. We're going to get back to it uh, later on. So basically, if you remember this picture, each register has a valid bit. If the valid bit is set, the value in the table is correct, meaning the value that's assigned to the register is already written and up to date. Otherwise, the tag specifies where to find the correct value. It could be in the reorder buffer. And as we will see, it could be in the reservation stations. Uh, tag is a unique name for the value to be produced, basically. Basically, we're associating a tag uh, value uh, with a tag over here. OK, keep that in mind. We've seen this already, but uh, we're going to go to uh, a slightly different version of it. So recall from the precise exceptions lecture, we actually covered this. Uh, we have a register file, we have a valid bit, value, and tag, and we have the reorder buffer. I'm not going to talk a lot about reorder buffer here at this point. I assume that you know the principles of how it works. So the key is tag was the pointer to the reorder buffer entry over here. In this lecture, uh, we're going to change the name a little bit, call the register file a register alias table. You will see that uh, later on. There's going to be a mapping table later on. And the tag is going to be the pointer to the reservation station entry that will produce the value because we're going to put instructions into the reservation stations, right? Instructions will still have a reorder buffer entry if you want precise exceptions, but we're going to ignore that uh, for simplicity for now because you don't want to go through too many things to really understand the concept. We're going to put back reorder buffer in uh, uh, toward the end of the lecture. So let me give you a high level overview of Thomas Sowell's algorithm. So you have this reservation station that you want to put the instructions in. When an instruction is being decoded, uh, if you, you first check if, there is a, if a reservation station is available, meaning can you put this instruction to, into the buffer? If it's not available, then you're going to stall. So stall happens here only if a reservation station is not available or your order buffer entry is not available. And hopefully uh, you size these things so stalls don't happen that much. If the reservation station is available, you put the instruction, the renamed operands, meaning source value and tag into the reservation station. And you only rename the instruction Rename the register basically if the reservation station is available. That makes sense because you're not going to move the pipeline if, uh, if you're stalling. While in the reservation station, each instruction is going to watch a data bus. This data bus is going to be broadcasting uh, uh, the tags and the values of instructions that produce the tags and values at that point in time, finished execution, in other words. And these instructions, all instructions watch the common data bus for tag of its sources. When the tag is seen, the instruction is going to grab the value for the source and keep it in the reservation station. So this is where the comparator comes in. When both operands are available, instruction is ready to be dispatched to its functional unit. And then you dispatch the instruction to the functional unit when it's ready, meaning both operands are available. Okay, this is just a long thing, but it's very relatively easy. After instruction finishes in the functional unit, you basically arbitrate for the common data bus or have multiple common data buses. You broadcast the tagged value onto the common data bus. And the register file is also connected to the common data bus. Uh, and if the tag in the register file matches the broadcast tag, uh, the broadcast value is written into the register and the valid bit is set. Uh, and also this is uh, true for the reservation stations. So we will see this with some animation uh, in a little bit. Okay, any questions on this? 
It's, this is just to show you that there's an algorithm actually to, that enables this, uh, but we'll see this with this animation first. So let's do this exercise. So we have, uh, what I'm going to assume here is these instructions. We're going to execute this uh, program completely in an out of order machine. And this is a pipeline structure that we have. We have adds and multiplies only. So it's a bit boring, but even this one is going to buy performance for us. So add executes like this, it has four cycle execute stage and multiply executes like this, six cycle execute stage. We're gonna assume one adder and one multiplier. Uh, and we're gonna assume that these are pipelined, adder and multiplier are pipelined. Uh, the question, there are three questions over here basically, actually four questions over here. How long does it take to execute this code in a non-pipeline machine? So non-pipeline machine is easy. Uh, you can see that there are four ads. Each of them take, uh, yeah, each of them takes seven cycles and two multiplies and each of them take 11 cycles. With these assumptions, you take 50 cycles to execute in a non-pipeline machine, basically. Again, I'm ignoring the fact that pipelining adds overhead over here. Uh, and then the next question is, how long does it take to execute this in an in-order dispatch pipeline machine with imprecise exceptions? So we're going to ignore precise exceptions with no forwarding and forwarding. And how long does it take to execute this in an out-of-order dispatch machine or pipe and pipeline machine with imprecise exceptions with forwarding? So let's, say, let's do the first one. Again, I'm going to go, not go through this uh, because we've done this earlier, right? With in-order dispatch pipeline machine without forwarding, this is the timeline that you can come up with based on the instruction dependencies that are provided. And forwarding doesn't happen. As a result, it looks kind of like this. And basically, it takes 31 cycles. So this is clearly an improvement over 50 cycles by pipelining. That's good. But pipelining adds clock cycle. We're not looking at clock cycle time over here. So if you look at an in-order dispatch pipeline machine with forwarding, now forwarding actually reduces this to 25 cycles because now you can move the instructions a little bit earlier because you enable data forwarding. So these should be all relatively familiar to you because these are all older machines. But basically it shows that we've come from 50 cycles, non-pipeline machine to 25 cycles in a pipeline machine with forwarding. Now the question is, can we do better? And auto-order dispatch pipeline machine with forwarding takes 20 cycles basically. And it essentially looks like this. You don't need to know exactly how auto order execution operates. You can draw this over here. And once you draw this, uh, this is what we see basically. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you can see that this instruction is waiting over here. I didn't write the weights over here. And this instruction is waiting. And this instruction is waiting in the reservation stations. Uh, but the independent instructions can execute. As a result, we reduce the 25 cycles from in order to 20 cycles with auto order. And again, this may sound small. It's 20%, first of all, but if the latencies increase with loads, and if your buffer size is increased, and if your program is not Mickey Mouse like this, if your program is a real program, the real effect of auto order execution becomes much larger. Uh, in real systems, actually, there is a very, very clear distinguishable effect of auto order execution compared to in order execution with forwarding, most aggressive forms of in order execution. That's why all processors employ auto order execution today. And you cannot go back because if you go back, you lose performance. So if you make the business decision saying, oh, I want to get rid of auto order execution and I'm going to make money, well, good luck. Because if you do that, then who's going to buy your processors, right? Everybody wants higher performance going into the future. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, let me introduce the setup uh, and we're going to start the lab. Then we're going to take a break and we're going to continue with the simulation. So basically what we're going to do is simulate this program that I showed you. This is the program we will simulate. You can see it's the same program that I showed you earlier. And we're going to have a register alias table. Let me introduce the register alias table. I just look at 11 uh, registers over here, and all of them are valid initially. And uh, you can see the tag doesn't matter if a register is valid. And the values are simply 1 through 11 initially, again. Now, for auto order execution, we have a reservation station for the add unit. So we have an adder. That was the assumption, right? We have an adder. And we have a multiplier. Assume that these are pipelines. So every cycle, you can send an instruction to the adder and the multiplier. Uh, and we have two different reservation stations. And remember, what do reservation stations contain? The instructions and their source values, essentially. I ignore some of the other entries over here in the reservation station. I, I basically talk, uh, show whatever is really needed for understanding purposes. Basically, you can see that for, uh, let's take a look at one of the uh, reservation stations over here, one of the entries. So there are four entries in this reservation station, A, B, C, D. Uh, there are four entries in the reservation station for the multiplier x, y, z, t. Uh, and each entry has source one and source two because these are two operands 
uh, uh, two operand operations, right? And each source has a valid bit, tag, and a value. Initially, this gets directly copied from the register into the reservation station so that you can keep track of uh, which tag you need to wait uh, so that you can get the value from the correct producer instruction. So now the structure hopefully makes sense, right? Basically, in each reservation station, you store the tag, value, and valid bit. If the valid bit is one, the value is trusted and ready. If the valid bit is zero, the tag is trusted, value is not trusted. You wait for the tag to be produced. What does produced mean? Some instruction is going to ex finish executing and it's going to broadcast the tag and the value. And when it's broadcast, the tags get compared. Basically, when this tag gets broadcast, what does that mean? This tag gets communicated to all of the tag fields in the machine, including the register file, including the source one, including the source two here, including the source one here, including the source two here, because they have, basically we have a wire that goes through all the tags and each entry has a comparator. You're gonna compare this tag that's broadcast to the tag that's stored inside over here. So now you can see a lot of comparators, right? And that's one of the downsides, but this is what enables a producer instruction that broadcasts a tag to communicate that value that's also broadcast with the tag to the instruction that consumes it. So value is also broadcast, but it's not compared. If the tag matches and if the valid bit was zero, that's important also keep in mind, uh, then the value gets captured and written into the appropriate value field. Does this make sense? So I've kind of given you the structure of it. Now, I think uh, we should take a break. Uh, and when we come back from the break, we're going to simulate 20 cycles of execution of this program. And this program is going to take exactly 20 cycles. Okay. Uh, Yeah, your camera is uh, uh, lagging a little oh, bit. Oh, okay, why? So maybe we should turn it off and turn okay, it off. Okay, let's see. Just in case. Should I...
are the uh, Okay. Okay, let's get started. So if you recall, uh, we're going to simulate our first out of order execution machine. That's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always fun to simulate machines. Uh, it's easier to simulate pipeline machines, but it's a bit harder to simulate the out of order machine. So this is the program we will simulate. I've kind of laid the uh, groundwork, register alias table, reservation station for the different add and multiply units. And we have add and multiply as separate execution units, and they have separate tag and value buses, as you can see. So whenever an instruction is ready, it gets scheduled to its execution unit. It has a source value, source one value, source two value, as well as a tag it's going to broadcast. That's why you have three inputs over here. Source one value, source two value, and the tag it's going to broadcast, which is the reservation station ID over here. So the tags we're going to use are the reservation stations IDs over here. So we're going to rename the registers to the 
reservation station IDs as we discussed. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so this is cycle zero. This is the state of the machine. Reservation stations are clear. Uh, registers are all valid. And we're gonna fetch in the first cycle, the first multiply instruction. Nothing interesting happens because we're just fetching the instruction, right? Interesting things happen in the second cycle. In the second cycle, we're gonna decode this instruction and fetch the next instruction. So let's take a look at what it, what it means to decode an instruction. Remember, multiply gets decoded and allocate into a reservation station, X in this case. The first step is, do I have a reservation station entry available to put this instruction in? And I do because the multiply reservation stations are all empty. So I first allocate the first reservation station over here. So multiply gets assigned to reservation station X. Okay. And then, yeah, that's the first step, as I said, right? We already did that step. Then you access the register alias table to read the sources of the multiply. Multiply has two sources, R1 and R2. Now we access the register alias table to see, to read R1. R1 is valid. Tag doesn't matter because it's valid. Value is one. We read that, put it into the source one area entry for reservation station entry X. Okay, that's good. So it's very simple, basically. You copy this entry, valid tag and value that belongs to register R1 into source one fields of reservation station entry X, which multiply was allocated into. You do the same thing for source two, basically. Source two is R2. We read R2 and copy what we see, which is valid, no tag, it doesn't matter, values two, okay? Now, uh, we know that in the next cycle, this multiply should be able to execute because both of its sources are valid, right? That's the idea over here. Okay, this may not be that interesting because this is the first instruction, right? But the next important step while decoding is this instruction is we need to rename the destination register R3 to X so that later instruction that source that version of R3 should get the value from reservation station X. Right. So basically, what does renaming mean? Let me do it again. Uh, if you can go back. So basically, R3 was valid, values three. We're going to redefine it with this multiply. And the redefinition basically multiply is going to write to R3, meaning it becomes invalid at this point. Okay. It becomes invalid. And the R3 that's going to be produced is going to be produced by the instruction that's in the reservation station X, meaning this multiply that we just allocated to that reservation station is going to produce it. And later instructions now, if they read R3, they will know that the value is going to come from this tag and they will read that tag and they will wait for that tag. And the value doesn't matter. It's not trustworthy anymore because uh, the, uh, the, we don't know the value yet. Okay. Now R3 is now renamed to X. Its new value will be produced by the reservation station that is identified by tag X. Now multiply in RSX, reservation station X is ready to execute in the next cycle. So there's some logic that determines whether the multiply is going to be ready to execute. Partially it can be done in this cycle. It can be done in the next cycle also. So I'm not going to talk about timing as much, but there are a lot of interesting timing issues in how this works also. We're going to talk about functionality right now, not timing necessarily. Okay, so that was cycle two, basically. We decoded the first multiply instruction, which means that we went through these four steps. We're going to do that four step every time we decode an instruction, basically. And we fetch the next instruction, but that's not that interesting for our purpose. In the third cycle, what happens is multiply starts executing right now because both of its value, uh, sources are uh, ready. Uh, so basically what happens is you check the readiness. There's some logic that always checks the readiness of instructions. So if this instruction is ready, it has not started executing before. So it should start executing if it's ready. And if there are multiple instructions that become ready for some reason, you need to decide which instruction goes to the functional unit. And it's going to uh, basically be, both sources are ready. So you wake up the instruction. This is called wake up in terminal uh, and out of order execution terminology. And then the instruction gets dispatched to the multiply units because both of its sources are ready. And the values you can see are one and two. And the tag also gets communicated, as you can see, to the function unit, because that tag is going to be broadcast with the result value six cycles later, because we know that multiply takes six cycles. In fact, in the middle of the sixth cycle, as we will see in this, because we want to do forwarding as well. Okay, so now we're going to decode add instruction concurrently. While this is happening here, add instruction needs to be decoded. So you know now how to decode instruction, right? Basically, how do we decode instruction uh, add? 
uh, we basically first check whether there's a reservation station entry available for at. So we look at the other reservation stations. And yes, it is available. Uh, so we allocate uh, the instruction into uh, reservation station entry A. We read the sources. One source is R3. One source is R4. R3 looks like this. It's not valid, but we know the tag. It's X value. We don't care. So we basically copy this entry to source one. And source two, we do the same thing. Uh, nope, sorry. Source two, we do the same thing. Source two is available. Values four. Tag doesn't matter again. Uh, it's copied into source two. Now it looks interesting, right? This instruction cannot execute in the next cycle because one of the sources is not valid. It's going to be produced by reservation station X, which is over here. So when this, uh, this instruction over here completes, it's going to broadcast the tag value X so that this instruction can make its source valid and then get the value. Okay. So basically, we do the same steps one through four in the previous prior site for add. We need to rename R5 to A. So R5, add is going to write to R5. So R5 becomes invalid now, and the value is going to be produced by tag A, meaning the reservation station A in this particular case. Okay. Now we're uh, linking which registers uh, are going to be produced by where. Okay. So that's two instructions now, and then we're going to fetch the next instruction. So let's do cycle four. Cycle four. Multiply, the first multiply is happily executing over here. It's not finished yet because it takes six cycles. Add in this reservation station waits. Uh, reservation station A waits because one source is not valid, as you can see. So there's some logic that keeps checking whether the instructions are ready. And there are no instructions ready, so you cannot schedule any instruction. You cannot dispatch an instruction to the functional unit. And then we're going to decode this add. So I'm going to go through some of this relatively quickly because we're going to do exactly the same steps. Steps one through four. So what does that mean? We check whether there's a reservation station entry available for this ad. Yes. And we allocate reservation station B for this ad. We read the sources and put them into reservation station B. One source is valid, values two. The other source is register six, basically. It's also valid, value six. Now this looks good. It's going to execute in the next cycle, hopefully, because it looks like it's ready. And we're going to rename R7 to B because this instruction is producing R7. It was allocated to reservation station B. Right. Okay. So we're done with the decoding of this ad. And we're going to fetch the next instruction. Now, the interesting thing is this ad that we just renamed is ready to execute in the next cycle. So it's going to be dispatched into the functional unit before the prior ad, which was dependent on the multiply. So we're going to enable out of order execution this way. So basically, it will be executed out of order in the next cycle. So next cycle is cycle five, basically. Uh, this multiply here is happily executing, taking its sweet time. This add is still waiting because it's valid. one of its values is not produced yet. Now this add, the logic checks and finds out that add in reservation station B is, val is ready to execute because both of its sources are valid. So it gets dispatched into the functional unit. Uh, and it's going to add two and six, as you can see. And it's going to broadcast the tag B. It will take four cycles. And we will see what happens four cycles later. Now we're going to decode uh, this ne next add, add R8, R9, put the result into R10. Let's take a look at that. Uh, well, let's take a look at that, meaning we're going to go through this relatively quickly. So this is add R8, R9. Actually, this is basically the decoding. It, it went through it quickly. Uh, but basically, R8 is valid, and the value is 8. R9 is valid, the value is 9. So we basically read the values corresponding to R8 and R9, and put them into source one and source two into reservation stations, and then rename register 10 to C, because C is the reservation station that's going to produce register 10. Okay. So again, there's another interesting that's, happen that's going to happen. This, uh, this add over here in C is going to be able to execute in the next cycle. It's going to be dispatched because we have a pipeline adder, as I said earlier. Okay. And then we're fetching the next instruction. So cycle six, next cycle, multiply is happily executing. This add is happily waiting because the source register is not ready, maybe unhappily waiting because it cannot execute. This next add is happily executing. Now, this add that we just renamed in the prior cycle can execute because its sources are ready and it gets dispatched into the pipeline adder. Now we're going to decode the multiply. This multiply sources are R7 and R10. So we're going to have R7. Let's take a look at this. R7 is 0 and B. So it's not valid. Tag is B meaning the result is going to be produced by reservation station B, which is correct, actually, if you look at it, meaning the, this add 
uh, this ad is going to produce source value that belongs to R7. And the, the second uh, one is R10. R10 says invalid and reservation station C is going to produce the value of R10 that you need. So that also gets written to source two. So this instruction has both of its sources invalid. Uh, so it's going to wait for both of its sources. And both of those sources are come from, going to come from different instructions, as you can see. Those different instructions are going to broadcast their tags and values at different times, as we will see. And then we're going to rename R11 to Y, which is the reservation station entry that we allocated to multiply. Of course, we checked whether the reservation station entry was available. That I'm kind of assuming that at this point, because we have reservation station entries available. OK, and then we fetch the next instruction. So cycle seven is the last cycle where we finish decoding all the instructions that you see in this program. So this multiply is happily executing still, because multiply takes a long time, as you can see. This ad is waiting, because its source register value is unavailable. This ad is executing. This ad is still executing also. So you can see that these instructions were dispatched out of order into the adder, and they're executing concurrently with the multiply uh, that they're independent of, essentially. Uh, only the dependent instruction is waiting over here. This multiply, as you can see, cannot execute. Both of its sources are invalid, so it's going to wait also. And now we're going to decode the add instruction, which should hopefully be easy again. So what we do is, so before we decode, let's we do it. So before we decode, uh, we need to read. Uh, there's something interesting over here. We first need to read R5, 0A. It's invalid. The result is going to come from A. So uh, well, we need to allocate add to the uh, reservation station to D. So 0 and A should go here. And then we read register 11, which is 0 and Y. Right. So basically, both of its sources are also invalid for this add. And add is going to rename register 5. So there's something interesting happening over here. So basically, these are the sources that it read. And then it renamed register 5 to D. So there's something interesting happened that to register 5. Basically, at this point, all six instructions are now decoded and renamed. Register 5 we got renamed twice. As you can see, in the pipeline, there are two instructions that are writing to register 5. This add, which is not executed yet. It does not start executing. And this add, that also has not started executing. So there are two definitions of R5 in the pipeline. And instructions that are dependent on the correct version of R5 get their values based on the tags that they have read at appropriate times when they were decoded and renamed. So this is important to notice, basically. The, uh, the R5 was written twice. As a result, it was renamed twice. So for later instructions, the producer of R5 is actually reservation station entry D. For prior instructions, meaning these three instructions over here, the producer of R5 is reservation station entry A, if you recall what we did. OK, so this is the cycle where we decoded all the instructions. The rest is going to be execution. And let's take a look. So far, no instruction has broadcast its tag and value. So we're going to see that. But just to uh, give you what we're going to do, if you just look at this picture, and if I didn't give you the instructions over there, you can reconstruct the program. Ignore the instructions. If you just look at what I show you over here, the register file or register alias table, reservation stations, you should be able to reverse engineer what the program is. You should definitely be able to reverse engineer what the data flow graph is. You may not be able to perfectly reverse engineer the sequential order because this is a Tarta data flow machine. It doesn't care about the sequential order. It just connects the instructions in a data flow manner. So by just looking at it, we're going to construct a data flow graph. Keep that in mind. OK, so cycle eight is interesting because here, instructions are going to broadcast. So multiply is taking six cycles, and it's going to broadcast its value at the beginning of the sixth cycle, let's say. That's what we're assuming here. Multiply in RSX is done. So it's going to broadcast its tag x and its value 2. Basically, these two will be broadcast to all places in the machine where, they are, where there are things that are waiting, potentially waiting for that value, meaning all of the possible tags and values that you see in this picture. So let's take a look at it. x gets broadcast to this tags. Oh, there's something that's waiting. You check, and you check whether it's invalid. And it gets broadcast to these sources. Concurrently, it gets broadcast to these sources. Concurrently, it gets broadcast to these sources. Concurrently. So it's all happening concurrently, basically. Animation is easier serially, but hardware is very concurrent, as you can see. So basically, this X gets broadcast over here. And there are two places that are waiting for tag X, and they're invalid. So these places are going to capture the value that's going to be broadcast also, which is 2. 
and they'll become valid. So again, value broadcast is also happening concurrently. It can happen sequentially also. So you can actually schedule things depend if you know the timing perfectly, which you do actually when you, act, uh, if, uh, when you design the machine. Uh, but basically assume that tag and value are broadcast at the same time. All of the tags that match and that have valid bits zero capture the value, as you can see, right into the, in this case, a register alias table, register file becomes valid. R3's three's value is two at this point. And also this instruction was waiting for tag X. It was uh, invalid before it became valid and the value became two. Now add in the reservation station A is ready to execute in the next cycle, as you can see, because it's producer instruction produced the tag, the value that it needs. I'm not going to call it, calling it R3 because R3 is not interesting anymore. It's really the tag, which was X that was sent. It captured the source value, which is two, and it's ready to execute because both of its source values are ready at this point. So again, this is the crux of auto word execution also. You capture the broadcast tag and value so that the producer's value is communicated to the consumer. And that all happened because we renamed the produced value to a name that the consumer actually knows about also, a unique name. Okay. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, Okay, so this is the first thing that happened in this cycle. Uh, and you can see it's also discussed over here. All of this happened concurrently. And you can see the complexity right now, right? The wires go all over the place and there are comparators for each tag. Uh, and this is a small machine actually. Existing machines can have hundreds of entries over here. Uh, so there's a lot of comparators, there's a lot of wires and there are only two execution units over here. Existing machines have, can have tens of execution units potentially. So existing machines are much more complex. This is just a toy machine, Mickey Mouse machine, if you will. Okay, this is what happened in the cycle eight. But there's another thing that happened in cycle eight. Add in reservation station B is also finished executing. So you can see that it, 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 was, it was taking four cycles. At the end of the, uh, basically during the fourth cycle, it broadcasts its tag and value, B and eight. And the same thing happens basically. B gets broadcast to all of the tag places and some of them match, as you can see, because they're invalid. And you can see that happening. It gets broadcast over here also, and that matches, nice. Meaning that that's a dependent instruction. There's nothing over there. Even though there's nothing over there, you need to broadcast everywhere, right? You don't know where the, where the, uh, where the destination uh, instructions or producer, uh, consumer instructions are. And then the value gets, well, concurrently the value gets broadcast and the matching ones capture the value, okay? So R7 becomes eight at this point, it's valid for later instructions that are going to get the value. They can get it from the register file or register alias table, that's good. This instruction now has one of its sources ready, but unfortunately it cannot execute in the next cycle because the other source is still not ready, okay? So it's still going to wait for someone else to produce that source. Okay, so cycle eight, third slide, basically nothing else happens over there because the other instructions actually are still waiting. The other instructions are these instructions that we uh, this multiply and this add over here. Okay, let's take a look at ninth cycle, which is not that interesting, uh, basically. Uh, well, I guess it's interesting in the sense that, so, so this instruction is going to finish, basically. It's, it's going to clean up, deallocate the entries and finish. Uh, this instruction is also going to finish. We're assuming imprecise exceptions. If this was precise exceptions, these instructions would be waiting for the reorder buffer to check and they would finish whenever actually the thing's done. But we're going to get back to precise exceptions later. For now, assume that the instructions finish out of order for simplicity. Again. So this instruction is broadcasting its value. So you can take a look at that. So basically C is broadcast on the tag because that's C and value 17, eight plus nine is 17, as you can see, is broadcast also. So once that gets broadcast, R10 becomes 17 and valid. And this over here becomes valid and 17 also. So now this instruction in the multiplier reservation station entry Y can get dispatched, okay, in the next cycle. So in the next cycle, uh, that instruction starts executing, as you can see. So it becomes a bit boring at this point. Uh, instructions are executing, some of them are waiting, as you can see. Uh, at cycle 12, this ad happens to finish because it's the fourth cycle of the ad and it broadcasts tag A and value six. And you can see that there's no register file entry that has tag A because register five was written with tag A, but someone else overwrote that register with tag D. 
So a register file doesn't get updated here because someone else overwrote the definition of the register. But the instruction that was supposed to get this definition, this version of register five, gets it because it got the correct tag, which was A over here. So it gets updated with A. So if you go back, there's no A tag in the register file, but there's a tag A over here in the reservation station. And that belongs to this instruction, as you can see. OK, so now this instruction has one of its values ready, but it cannot start executing because another value has not been produced yet. It's going to be produced by the other inst executing instruction, which is this one, as you can see. So this multiply takes its sweet time, cycles pass, as you can see. In this cycle, this multiply uh, broadcasts its tag and value. So I'm going through this relatively quickly at this point. And this is what happens. R11 becomes 136. And this source 2 becomes valid and 136 because uh, the tag that's broadcast, I don't know why this is, is Y in this particular case. And the result that's broadcast is 136. OK, at this point, as you can see, all instructions are either executing or done. And the last instruction that's executing is this add. So cycle 16, 17, 18, 19, it executes. At the end, it broadcasts and updates with register 5 in this particular case. Well, I shouldn't call it register 5. It broadcasts and updates D, tag D. So register 5 happens to get updated to 142. And nothing else gets updated over here because there's no other instruction that's waiting. This was the last instruction that we decoded. And in cycle 20, all of the instructions are done. Does this make sense? So I would recommend going through the simulation yourself uh, if uh, this didn't quite make sense. It's all principled and it makes sense, I think. Uh, uh, but basically, uh, this is how an out-of-order machine operates. The rest is all optimization and memory. We're going to kind of ignore memory, as I said, uh, for now. This is all registers. How do you handle memory becomes an interesting issue. OK. So let me, uh, any questions so far? Yes, please. Broadcast. So basically, that's a, that's a good question. What I assumed uh, and what I, what I said I assumed is you have two tag buses and two value buses, meaning uh, two tags can be broadcast at the same time. Two values can be broadcast at the same time, meaning for each tag, you have two comparators. Does that make sense? So that's a lot of buses, basically. If you want to reduce the hardware cost, you can say, okay, I'm going to broadcast only one tag and one value. Then you need to delay one of them, right? There needs to be some other logic that delays one of the instructions that wants to uh, broadcast. That's an excellent question. In existing machines, actually, it's not just two. It's 10 buses that may actually broadcast tags and values. So existing machines are actually quite complicated. And this is a very power-consuming part of the machine also. It's not just complexity in terms of hardware cost. These comparators consume power, right? Every cycle you're comparing hundreds of values, basically, in the machine. So if you don't make this power efficient, it's going to be expensive in terms of power. So auto word execution comes with a power cost. But if you take an advanced class on how to really design these machines, there are a lot of tricks you can play to make it power efficient. OK, any other questions? OK, so maybe I'll ask you questions, and I'll, or maybe I'll discuss some questions. So what is needed in hardware to perform tag broadcast and value capture? Actually, I've, I've given you the answer to this. Lots of, uh, you need uh, to make a value valid, wake up an instruction. Essentially, wires, comparators, and logic, right? You broadcast with wires, you compare the tags with comparators, and you have additional logic to check validity. If it's invalid and the tag matches, you capture the value and write it into the value location. Does the tag have to be the ID of the reservation station? And I kind of give, giving you the answer also. Anybody? Can the tag be something else? I would say yes. Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, who doesn't care? <laughs> Basically, uh, the tag does not have to be any unique name. Uh, that any, uh, The tag doesn't have to be the reservation station. The, the only thing you care about is linking the producer and the consumer and not losing that linkage and the value. So it could be any unique name that enables linking of the producer to the consumer. As we will see, it could be a physical register file entry in a little bit. So what can potentially become the critical path? I didn't discuss timing over here, but there are a lot of interesting timing issues. If you remember from the timing lecture, tag broadcast, uh, you need to broadcast a tag. Dependent instructions need to capture the value and write the result, uh, write the value into uh, their registers. And then the instruction needs to wake up. 
So this is called the scheduling loop in existing machines. It's kind of a loop. You broadcast a tag, somebody captures the value, and they get dispatched, and then they later you broadcast a tag. So this loop actually is very timing critical. And people actually optimize the machines a lot to reduce the time or break it into multiple cycles. Breaking into multiple cycles actually lead to other headaches, which we're not going to talk about. So how can you reduce the potential critical paths? More pipelining and prediction. So this becomes more complicated if you really want to reduce the critical paths, which we're not going to put into. OK, now let's draw the data flow graph for our example. So this was our example. If I ask you the easy question, draw the data, uh, data flow graph for this code, it should be easy, right? You basically draw a multiply, an add node, and then connect the nodes that actually communicate with each other. But you can actually do the same thing for the cycle seven. So I'm not going to give you the, uh, I'm not going to give you the instructions over here. I'm not going to give you the execution. I'm just going to give you this picture over here. Based on this picture, you can draw the data flow graph. Can people do it? Yes or no? Okay, maybe, maybe I'll do a part of it quickly. Uh, for you, uh, if I can do it, I don't know. Okay, I have it here. That's good. So let's try to switch. I'm not sure if this will work. So how do we switch over here? Is it this one or stop share first, right? Okay. So what do I share? Share screen. Advanced, let's see, content from second camera. Oh, that looks like me. <laughs> Switch camera. Okay, good. At least we did something. Uh, okay, I think that's the maximum we can have. That's okay. We can probably live with that. Well, why can't you see? Any reason? Is there? Yeah, there's something over here that doesn't enable you to see for some reason. Do you know? Oh, it's, it's, oh, okay, you can see now, but I don't know what happened. Okay. Yeah, but why is it sharing over there? It's not sharing on, or on Zoom, I think. Okay. Okay, maybe we don't do this. We just uh, switch camera to... Uh, okay, stop share. This is... Not content from second camera, but uh, so I don't share basically. How about that? So I don't share and we do this. So can we make this bigger? Can we make the uh, video bigger on Zoom? I think if you, if you do that, then this will be easy. Okay, and you guys can see this, right? Okay, so this is state of the, okay, I, sh I should not show you this one. <laughs> so this is our state of the uh, register file. Uh, and register alias table and register uh, uh, reservation station in cycle seven. Maybe you can make me uh, spotlight me so that people on Zoom can see it, right? It's good. Okay. Okay. It's good. Uh, so, okay. So this is what I'm given, right? Draw the data flow graph for the executing code. That's my task. And this is a good exam problem, actually. We have a lot of exam problems like this in your homework. You will see that. So how do I start? Well, it's easy. I look at this. Uh, actually, let me pick something. What do I think? I, I know something about this instruction. This is a multiply, right? Sounds good. One of its inputs is one, and the other input is two. That sounds good. And it's going to produce the tag x, right? OK, that sounds good. I'm going to start with instructions that are valid. That's always a good choice. Uh, valid meaning both of its sources are valid in the reservation stations, right? So another instruction over here is an add, and it's going to take uh, a value two, uh, which is sim same as this one, as you can see. So maybe I could I could have been smarter and put that ad over there, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, let's make a mess. Uh, and the other uh, input is six. Uh, and then uh, there's this instruction, as you can see over here. This is also an ad. Uh, one input is eight, and the other input is nine. Okay. Oh, I forgot this. Uh, this one is going to be produced by. Uh, it's going to produce tag B, and this one is going to produce uh, tag C. Right. Okay. That sounds good so far. Now let's take a look at this one. This one looks interesting because it has B and C that I just saw over here. So there's a multiply node over here that's going to take B and C from these earlier instructions and that's going to produce Y. Okay. That's good. And then maybe let's take uh, this one. This looks interesting. 
uh, uh, this is an add node that takes x as one of the values, as you can see, and that's one of the other values is four. Okay, and the last one is this one, zero a and zero y. Okay, this is going to be a, as you can see, because we just so uh, this is going to produce a. And the last one is this add over here, which takes. Okay, if you want to be really uh, picky, the left register is this one, and the right register is this one. <laughs> That's why I said I was not smart enough to locate these nodes, but it's not terrible at least. And this is D, right? So this is the data flow graph. I can perfectly construct the data flow graph for this code, not code, for this machine status. Now, if you want to assign registers to it, it's a different issue, but it's not that bad also. Basically, you can assign different registers. For example, uh, when I look at the uh, register file over here, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, so D, I know what D is, R5, right? So it's going to be R5. Okay, that's good. Uh, I know what, I don't know what A is. That's bad, fine, maybe we'll figure it out. I know what Y is, R11, as you can see over here. Uh, I know what X is, it's R3. And I know what B is, R7. I know what C is, R10. So the only thing I don't know is A, and I'll leave you to figure that out. The question is, can you figure that out? <laughs> you can think about it a bit. Maybe you cannot figure that out, but I think you can. You need to think about it a bit. Okay, I'll leave you with that exercise. But the point of this exercise is really, you can draw the data flow graph perfectly. You may not be able to allocate the registers perfectly, you may not be able to sequential, get the sequential order of the instructions perfectly. Now, I know which instructions these are. I know the register names of most of them. The sequential order is a difficult problem. What is the sequential order? This is the data flow order, as you can see. Which one goes first in the real program? Well, tough luck, I don't know. If you knew something else about the allocation, then that can help you. Meaning these, these entries are allocated sequentially, then that can tell you about the sequential order also, right? But I'm not going to assume that right now. And if you do that assumption, then you can also construct the sequential order out of the state of flow graph. But basically, just by looking at this machine, we were able to draw the data flow graph. Uh, that sounds perfect to me, right? Meaning this is really a data flow machine. Okay. So let's see. There are some questions, I think. Oh, it's sharing. Uh, okay. Maybe I, so maybe there's, a, uh, uh, let me see. There's a question from before. Do modern processors have register files plus ROB plus reservation stations as three distinct components? Or are these somehow merged uh, to reduce area, et cetera? Also, can one observe how the program is reordered by the hardware itself? The actual order of how the instructions are executed. So there are two different questions. One, the first question we're going to handle, modern machines actually have, we're going to introduce reorder buffers soon, if you have time. I don't know. We have some time. That's good. Uh, the second question is different. Can you, can you actually observe this order? No, as a programmer, you cannot observe this order. As a programmer, you cannot observe this. This is if you look internally into the machine, right? And you cannot observe the state of flow of order. You can, of course, draw the data flow graph yourself, but you cannot observe which order instructions are really executed internally. But we'll, we'll handle the first question, which is actually a very good question next. Actually, the second is also a very good question, but the whole purpose of our execution is not to observe, uh, not to expose it to the programmer. Okay. Basically, this is what we did. This is a slightly harder task. Oh, sorry. Stop share that one. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Okay, now I share the screen. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so basically, this is what we did with this exercise. Uh, draw the data flow graph, which was easy to do, and provide the executing code in sequential order, which was harder to do, because we cannot perfectly reconstruct the sequential order unless we make some other assumptions in terms of allocation of the registers uh, reservation stations, etc. Okay, and this is the perfectly constructed data flow graph, as you can see over here. Basically, uh, uh, this is uh, nodes of the data flow graph are operations performed by the instruction, add or multiply. Arcs are tags in Thomas Sowell's algorithm, and tags can be reversed, reverse traced back to the register IDs, as you can see. In other words, we can easily reverse engineer the data flow graph of the executing code. Okay, so some more questions, which I'm not going to go into a lot, but there are actually a lot of really, really interesting design choices over here. When is the reservation station entity allocated? You can think about it. Should the reservation stations be dedicated to each functional unit or should they be global across functional units? 
these are actually uh, centralized versus distributed. This is a very common trade-off in systems. Do you make a buffer centralized? Do you make a buffer distributed? And there are trade-offs. There are very fundamental trade-offs. If you make the buffer centralized, it's bigger. You cannot specialize it to the functional units. Uh, and also, uh, it may be slower. If you make it uh, uh, distributed to each functional unit, you can specialize it to the functional unit. Uh, but you cannot dynamically allocate buffer entries from one uh, buffer to another buffer, basically. So this is basically the same trade-off as centralized buffers versus distributed buffers. Should reservation stations, this is actually going back to the question that your colleague asked on Zoom, should reservation stations and reorder buffers store data values, or should there be a centralized physical register file where all the data values are stored? And we're going to talk about that next. Basically, one problem with the design that we saw is values were all over the place. There are values in the register file, there are values in the reservation stations, and I didn't show you the reorder buffer, but the reorder buffer also has values. Do we really need to have values all over the place? If you think about the worst case, if every instruction is sourcing one single register, register one, everybody reads register one. Source register one is register one, source register two is register one for hundreds of instructions in the machine. So the same value gets replicated in the entire machine. Does it really make sense? Why, why, why do this basically? Why not just set a pointer to that value and store the values compactly only in one place, basically? So we're going to look at that in a little bit. Existing machines do that. Timing, exactly when does an instruction broadcast is tagged? And there are many other design choices for our engines as well. So basically, we did this example. Uh, I will leave the example with out-of-order execution for precise exceptions uh, to you. Uh, okay, so this is an example of precise exceptions, but I'm going to give you the concepts. Uh, so basically, uh, what happens with precise exceptions? So basically, the idea is very really simple. You add a reorder buffer to reorder instructions before committing them to the architectural state. An instruction updates the register alias table only when it completes execution, not when it broadcasts its tag, basically. This is also called a front-end register file. Now, an instruction updates a separate architectural register file when it retires. So if you want to do this in an out-of-order machine, you need to have a separate architectural register file. When, is, when is the instruction is the oldest instruction in the machine has complete execution, it updates this architectural register file. So we have front-end register file that's used for renaming that contain the uh, values that are running ahead, if you will, that are speculative. And they have an architectural register file that contains the committed states that the programmer should see. So one is called the future register file. One is called the architectural register file that the programmer should see, basically. So we will see this. The architectural register file is always updated in program order, basically. That's, what, that's the real architectural state as a result. Or an exception or a branch misprediction. What you do is you flush the pipeline and copy the architectural register file to the front-end register file so that you have a consistent state for an exception. So hopefully this makes sense. So basically, we call this our initial out-of-order machine, register alias table, reservation station, reservation station over here. We add an architectural register file at the end and a reorder buffer for precise exceptions. And you can see that. Uh, architectural register file doesn't need to have valid bits because it's always valid. The registers over here are always valid because they've always been written, updated, based on what the programmer said they should be updated. Right. Here, some values may be being produced in the machine, but that's not happening uh, in the architectural register file. So that's the key distinction between front-end and architectural register file. So let's take a look at this. Basically, this is the reordering that we add. And that's what the second hump is. We looked at the schedule hump. We look at, let's look at the reorder hump a little bit. But one issue with this is now values are replicated all over the place. Let me give you the extent of the problem. So there are values all over the place where I mark these. In the register file, in the architectural register file, front-end register file, reorder buffer, you can see the source one, source two values, source one, source two values. Basically, there could be thousands of places where the values are. And as I said, in the worst case, the same register can be replicated in many places, of course, not in the register files. So how do we get rid of the replicated values? This is another picture. Basically, you have a physical register file that stores, that's a centralized value storage. This is really a huge register file, let's say. I don't know, it could be 256, 512 entries in existing machines. You have a reorder buffer. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to change that. But basically, you have the front-end register map. It essentially contains pointers to the physical register file. So now you're going to use the physical register file to consolidate the values, also to do renaming. This is our namespace. We're going to rename the architectural registers to physical registers. And this is the renaming map you can see. Register 1 is mapped to register 18 over here. Is it ready? We don't know. It may not be ready yet. 
because the instruction that actually is going to produce physical register 18 is going to broadcast this tag to make it ready or not. And you can see other things over here. Basically, all the registers are mapped to uh, physical register values over here. Uh, the same thing also happens over here. Uh, I mean, you can also make things uh, faster by making things valid, uh, but I'm not going to go through exactly how this operates. Uh, there's also architectural register map. These are the registers uh, and their values in terms of uh, the retirement values. Basically, these are the, this is the retired state of the machine. Register one, architectural state of the register one is you can find it in reg physical register 12. Architectural state of register five, for example, is in physical, physical register five, happens to be there. So if you want to reconstruct the architectural state, you basically go through the architectural registers at the architectural register map and read the physical registers corresponding to the architectural registers. Okay, so it's very powerful. Values are only in one place at this point, as you can see over here. There are no other values. It's just in the physical register file. Everything else is the pointers to values, including from the reorder book. Does that make sense? There's indirection happening right now. But this requires slight changes to the structure of the machine, as we will see. So these are basically pointers. The red parts are actually pointers, which are much smaller than the values themselves. So imagine, today we have 64-bit machines. Values are 64 bits. 64 bits times 1,000 values is 64,000 bits. But maps, uh, pointers can be much smaller because pointers can be 9 bits, for example, right? So this is what the state of the art is based. Most modern processors use a reorder buffer to support in-order retirement of instructions. They have a single register file called physical register file to store all registers. And both speculative and architectural registers and integer and floating point are still separate. There are two register maps to store pointers to the physical register file. One is a future front end register map used for renaming, as we discussed. And the second is the architectural register map used for maintaining the precise state. And this design avoids replication of values across reservation stations, Rob, et cetera. And this is again, to show you the picture. But to be able to do that, what you need to do is at decode and rename time, you allocate a destination physical register right now to the destination register. We don't talk about reservation stations anymore. Well, you allocate reservation stations also, but renaming is done uh, by renaming the destination register to the destination physical register. And you read and update the front end register map. And then before execution, you access the physical register file to get the source values. So you don't store the source values in the reservation stations, you store them in the physical register file. You access them from the physical register file. And then after execution, you access the physical register file to write the result values. And basically you broadcast the destination physical register as your tag and the value. So it's not, ta it's not ta the tag is not the reservation station entry, it's really the destination physical register ID at this point. And you update the architectural register map with the destination physical register at retirement. So this is essentially what this net burst architecture from Intel does. This is actually, there's a front end map and the retirement map, as you can see this architectural map, and you have a physical register file, and then you have reorder buffer separately, as you can see over here. Uh, so this is just for your reference. And Intel Pentium Pro actually had something like this, but not exactly what I described. Intel Pentium 4 later had uh, this structure over here. And many systems today actually has, have this structure. Just to complete uh, these pictures, uh, maybe I will uh, actually go through the picture. I'm going to talk about this at the beginning of next uh, right? But you can see basically, all of the machines today actually have this structure. Maybe I'll finish with this one. Just to give you the number of entries you can see over here, the reorder buffer 630 entries, according to some uh, people who reverse engineer Apple M1 Firestorm. They basically say reorder buffer 630 entries, integer rename is physical register files 354 entries, for example, and FP is 384 entries. So the machines today are big, basically. That's the conclusion. And think about the complexity implications of what we have seen. Okay, I will see you tomorrow. We will wrap up the concepts and then we'll call, talk about French prediction. Oh, sure, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, sure. Reservation station. Sure. Um, we had a full uh, station for uh, ads. Um, or, um, after finishing all the statements or uh, yeah. instructions, how do we know that uh, some spots are available? Like we didn't huh? delete them off the yeah. Uh, yeah, you mean how do we know which one's available and which yeah. one's not available? Yeah. So there needs to be some separate data structure, basically, hardware data structure that keeps track of a free list which ones are free and which ones are not free. And you need to consult that, basically. Sure. Yeah, I didn't talk about these. 
auxiliary data structures, there's a lot of them. Oh. Yeah, maybe I'll give these to you because I don't want to lose them, let's say. Oh, there's something on chat. Yeah, I'll probably go to the office because I need to finish something. Yeah, so uh, it was the charter.